Well, people of God, uh, as we continue to prepare our hearts to receive God's word to us this morning, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Let's pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be pleasing in your sight. Lord, you are our rock and you are our redeemer. And all of God's people together said, Amen. Amen. Well, friends in Christ, uh, it is the second Sunday in the season of Advent. Uh, it, now, in the last couple of months, we've kind of been walking together through our mission and our vision, and we've been looking at, at God's call that he has placed upon our lives and upon our church during this particular moment. Uh, but we're going to pause that for a little while. Okay, we're almost towards the end of that, but we're going to pause that and we're going to pick that up again in January because I felt that it was important for us to not let this season slide by without taking some time to realize again what Jesus is doing, and to realize again what Jesus has done. Uh, and if you were with us last week, Pastor Aaron kind of started us off uh, by asking us, in this Advent season, what do we need to give up? Right? What do we need to give up in order to ponder the gifts that God has given us, just as Mary pondered the gift of Jesus so long ago? What do we need to give up? What do we need to set aside as we prepare our hearts to receive Jesus this season? And today, I kind of want to build on that a little bit, and I want to look at something that's, that I think is pretty exciting. Now, Kristen spoiled a surprise for me, uh, but you guys, I want you to hold on to your pews a little bit because we're going to go to one of the most exciting times in the Bible, okay? I want you to open your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 1. Uh, there is a genealogy in Luke, uh, as Kristen mentioned, but we're going to look at the genealogy in Matthew. So Matthew chapter 1. Uh, I'm going to read verses 1 through 17, and this is a genealogy of Jesus. It's a family tree of Jesus. It, it traces his history back to Abraham, to King David, uh, and the whole line through it. So I'm going to start reading at verse 1. I'm going to read through verse 17. Uh, I thought about having us do this as like a, a reading all together, just for fun. Uh, but I, I figured I better not put you through that. So... Uh, you can follow along and listen as I read Matthew chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 17. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Amminadab, Amminadab, the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amon. Amon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father to Shealtiel, Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the father of Abiad, Abiad, the father of Eliakim, Eliakim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Achim, Achim, the father of Elihud, Elihud, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Mathan, Mathan, sorry, Mathan, Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Thus, there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. People of God, this is the word of the Lord. 
Whew. Pretty good stuff, right? Uh, who doesn't love reading and listening to a big, long list of names? Uh, and don't, uh, also when you go home, don't bother to look up pronunciations because they were all correct, okay? <laughs> Just trust me. Uh, what are we supposed to do with this? This is a part of our scriptures. It's a part of our story. And the question becomes, what are we supposed to do with this? Why should we care about this big, long list of names that is kind of hard to pronounce in different ways. This morning, there are uh, a few things I want us to notice. I want us to notice three things uh, about this genealogy this morning. Uh, and as we notice these things, I want us to reflect on how God was preparing us and preparing his people for the coming of Jesus. It's the season of Advent. We're talking about preparation. And in this genealogy, we see some things that God was doing to prepare his people for the coming of the Christ. Uh, and the first thing that we see is this. First thing I want us to notice is this, the long period of silence. If you still have your Bibles open, uh, if, you're, if you're open to Matthew chapter 1, turn back one page for me. Uh, can somebody like hold up their Bibles and show me what's back one page from Matthew chapter 1? I see it there, Larry. Looks like a big blank page, right? My, I have a little different Bible than you do, so I got writing over here. But it's a blank page, right? The Israelite people uh, had been waiting and waiting and waiting for a Savior. The last time they had heard from a prophet, the last time they had heard from God was 400 years ago. There's this period of time, 400 years between the last prophet in the Old Testament and the coming of Jesus Christ. Imagine this, friends. 400 years of waiting. 400 years of silence. God had not spoken to his people through a prophet in 400 years. Uh, we have a hard time, hard, hard time excuse me, sometimes when God doesn't answer our prayer in a couple of weeks, Right? And we think to ourselves, God, where are you? God, how come you're not answering this prayer? How come you're not uh, responding to this quicker? God, can't you move just a little bit faster? The Israelites were just coming off this time of waiting 400 years for anything from God. Any word, any comfort, anything like that. But all through this time, God was preparing them for Jesus. And sometimes God prepares us in silence, right? How many of you uh, have ever felt like God has been silent in your life? How many of you have ever felt like the Israelites did, that God hasn't spoken to you in a long time, that God seems to be far off or God seems to be distant? How many of you, when you look at your life, uh, might have a couple of these blank pages in there? Pages where you say, boy, it is really hard for me to see what on earth God might be doing right now. Friends, in that silence, in that stillness, God is cultivating and preparing our hearts to receive the good news. There's a long period of silence. The first thing I want us to notice about this this morning, the second is this, the structure of this genealogy. If you look at Matthew chapter 1, the verses we read, there are three distinct sections. So in the first section, we go from Abraham to King David. Then in the second section, we go from King David to uh, the Babylonian exile. And then we go from the Babylonian exile to Jesus. Uh, and in verse 17, it, it kind of clues us in and says there were 14 generations in all, uh, in all of these sections, right? 14 generations from Abraham to David. 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the return, uh, excuse me, to the Christ. Now, why does Matthew do this? Why write, uh, why write in these sections? Why point out that there's 14 generations in each of these? Well, Matthew is trying to do something. He's trying to explicitly point out to those reading and listening to this letter that Jesus is in the line of Abraham and David, that Jesus is the coming king that they have been waiting so long for. That Jesus is the promised Messiah who will reign on the throne of David forever that God promised and foretold so long ago. 
He wants to make like no mistake about this, right? Jesus is this person. The Jewish people had been waiting for a Savior, longing for a Messiah for so long. And Matthew right away says, okay, you've been waiting. Here he is. This is Jesus. This is a record right away in verse 1, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And if you don't get it, I'm going to tell you, the son of David and the son of Abraham. Matthew wants to make sure we know who this person is. And this structure, these three sections, uh, not only connect Jesus to uh, the, the foretold Messiah in the Old Testament, but it also shows us uh, that Matthew is trying to say something about Jesus. Oftentimes when we look at a genealogy, uh, when we read something like this in Scripture, we think, boy, this is just kind of a, a boring, dry history lesson. But there's more than that going on here. Matthew isn't trying to write an exact history uh, of the line of people from Abraham to Jesus, okay? It might seem like he's trying to do that, but this is more than just historical writing. This is theological writing. Uh, There's more going on underneath the surface. If you were to to look at this as purely historical writing, uh, you would find some errors, okay? Uh, I don't often tell you to look for errors in your scriptures, but we're going to look at something this morning because it's a tension we have to wrestle with, okay? Uh, You might look at this and think, boy, isn't that neat how that worked out? There's 14 generations all here and these three sections are equal. This is wonderful. Uh, But when you compare this against the history of the Old Testament, there are some people missing. Some people missing in this genealogy from Matthew. Uh, I want to point out a couple of these. So uh, when we go... Through Matthew, this is a list of kings. This is in the third section, I think. It's a list of kings that Matthew goes through. It says Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Uzziah, or Azariah, it's the same person, uh, Jotham, and Ahaz. Okay? Uh, And and we kind of see this line, we see this succession go. Book of 1 Chronicles. When 1 Chronicles chapter 3 lists out kings, it lists Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, but then there's three that aren't listed in Matthew. All of a sudden there's Ahaziah. Joash and Amaziah. And then the list picks up again with Uzziah, Jotham, and Ahaz. Okay? I hope this doesn't like rock your world this morning, okay? It's okay. Uh, Matthew is trying to do something beyond just this historical account of where Jesus came from. Matthew is trying to explicitly connect Jesus to the coming king, to the coming savior. And he's trying to do so, and there's a whole bunch of theories about why there's groups of 14 having to do with numbers and Hebrew letters, and, and we won't get into that that much this morning, okay? But I want us to know uh, that this genealogy is more than just a dry list of names. Matthew is trying to teach us something. He's trying to reveal something about who Jesus is. And in doing so, putting it right at the beginning of his gospel, he's trying to prepare our hearts to receive the good news of Jesus. Right? There's a reason that Matthew puts this right at the beginning instead of in the middle. Okay? It's kind of like, all right, get ready. I'm going to tell you about someone. I'm going to tell you about Jesus. And this is his history. This is his background. This is who he is. This is what he came to do. Prepare your hearts to, to receive the good news uh, of Jesus this morning. So we can look at this and say, did Matthew make a mistake? I mean, was he sloppy in his gospel writing? No, he wasn't. He was intentional. He was trying to teach us and reveal to us something about Jesus. He was trying to explicitly tell the people that were reading his letter that this was the Messiah. This was the one that we have been longing for. This is the one that we have been looking for. And so my question this morning is, in this Advent season, how are you longing for Jesus? How are you waiting for for Jesus? Where are you looking for Jesus to be made known in your life? I want us to notice one more thing uh, about this genealogy, and it won't be as uh, technical as this, okay? I want us to notice the stories. The stories. Uh, Every single name on this list has a story connected with it. Every single name on this list uh, would have been uh, would have been able to bring up for the original hearers of this, oh yeah, that person did this, or this is the the legend or the story associated with this particular person. As they listened to these lists, they would have said, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's right. I remember that story. I remember reading about that. 
I remember hearing about that. Each person would have brought to mind a particular portion of their history together. Uh, and in particular, uh, we don't have time to look through all the stories in this genealogy, but there are four names in this, or four people, I should say, mentioned in this, uh, that you would not normally find in a genealogy. Uh, there are four women listed in the genealogy of Jesus. Now, listing women as part of a genealogy was not a common practice. Uh, family lines and history were traced through the male members of the family. Uh, and so adding women into this would have been something that the original hearers and readers noticed. Right? They would have said, hey, wait a minute. Why is there a woman's name there? Hey, wait a minute. What, what's that person's story? What is that again? Uh, and there's not only women listed in this genealogy, uh, but the women listed are not exactly like uh, the most perfect women you would want associated with your family line, right? Uh, if you're looking at the line of the coming Christ, uh, and if a church committee were putting this line together, they might say, hey, I don't think we should include that person. That might not look so great. It might look a little sketchy. If you still have your Bibles open, uh, in verse 3, the first woman mentioned is Tamar. If you remember the story of Tamar, uh, she was suffering an injustice. She wasn't receiving what she needed to from her family after her husband had died. Uh, so she took matters into her own hands and she seduced her father-in-law. It's the story of Tamar. Uh, I'm just going to give you short versions here, okay? Because we, uh, we don't have time to go into all of this. Rahab, in verse 5, Rahab is a prostitute from Jericho. She's not an Israelite, right? She's not a member of the Jewish people. Uh, she's not working in a reputable field in her community. But here she is, listed in the genealogy of Jesus. And then we have Ruth, also listed in verse 5. Ruth was a Moabites uh, from the nation of Moab. Moab, if you remember, was an enemy nation. Now, we hear a lot about enemy nations in the Old Testament, so we can kind of lose sight uh, of just how bad that would have been for them. Uh, but God himself in Deuteronomy says this. He says, No Ammonite or Moabite shall enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. None belonging to them shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever. It's written in Deuteronomy that no Moabite shall ever enter the assembly of the Lord. And here we look at the genealogy of Jesus. And what do we have? A Moabite woman. The last one mentioned uh, is not mentioned by name, uh, Uriah's wife. This would have been Bathsheba. She's mentioned in verse 6. Uh, this was the woman that King David killed for. He killed Uriah uh, so he could be with this woman. And it's a, re it's a reminder of uh, a, a dark portion of David's history. David was often kind of remembered and thought of as this great, triumphant, wonderful king. Uh, but he had his dark times and his dark moments. And this including this in the genealogy of Jesus, would have brought that exact moment back to mind. So why, why on earth include these women and include this questionable history in the genealogy of Jesus? Friends in Christ, Matthew here is showing what God has been doing all along. And he's showing what God has been doing all along and how that will come to its fullness in the person of Jesus Christ. He's showing that all along, God has been breaking down the barriers that have been created. All along, God's love has been leaking out to places and to people that we think it shouldn't belong. All along, God has said, I know that there are these clear dividing lines that for people who should be in and should be out, but guess what? We're going to start to blur those. All along, the love of God has not been able to be suppressed to one people. We have started to see it leak out in different places in the Old Testament. And by including these women in the genealogy of Jesus, it's a reminder that in Jesus Christ, God's love will no longer be contained for one particular kind of people, but God's love will explode to the ends of the earth. That all the barriers that have been created to try and contain God, to try and earn God's love, all of those things are coming down. And they're coming down in the person of Jesus Christ. The Messiah is here to turn the world around, to turn the world back to him. The barriers that we see between 
uh, Jew and Gentile, uh, those insider-outsider barriers between male and female, between saint and sinner. All of those barriers are coming down. And we are all one in Christ Jesus. All throughout the Old Testament, God has been preparing the hearts of the Israelites for the radical nature of his love, for the fact that his love is not only meant for them, but it's meant for the Jews, the Gentiles, and all the ends of the earth. In this genealogy, in this list of names, we get a glimpse and a reminder of God's plan, and we get a glimpse of the heart of Jesus Christ. Matthew puts it right at the beginning to prepare us for the person that we are about to hear about. And so I'll ask this question this morning. Uh, As we sit in this Advent season, what barriers are we putting up around ourselves? What barriers are we putting up to the love of God? What barriers uh, might be up within your own heart that say, boy, you know, I'm not worthy to receive God's love because of this and because of this and because of this? What barriers might you be putting up in your hearts towards uh, towards people in your life to say, well, they're not really worthy of God's love because of this, and because of this, and because of this? What barriers do we put up uh, as, as a church? And I'm not just talking faith here, I'm talking as a church worldwide. What barriers do we put up that limits the love of Jesus Christ that we have all found and that we all find our identity in? What barriers need to come down this Advent season? People of God, today we uh, continue this journey of preparing our hearts to receive Jesus, uh, to allow Jesus to break down these barriers, uh, to trust that Jesus of silence, that Jesus is somehow working in us and preparing us, uh, to trust that, that Jesus is the one that we have been waiting for for so long. We have a chance to continue to uh, prepare our hearts for this, and we have a chance to do that this morning at the table of Christ. On Family Sundays, I love this, that, that every month we come together around this table and we are reminded of whose we are. We are reminded of the fact that we belong to Jesus. And As we gather in this Advent season, uh, I, I particularly love it today because we find ourselves in this tension. If you don't know this about me by now, I kind of like to sit in these places of tension. And I'm for worse. We're in this place this morning where we know that Christ has come. We know how the story ends. We know that Jesus has won the victory. And we know that we find our salvation and our life in him. But we also find ourselves at this place today where we look around at the world and we look at our own lives and we say, boy, Everything is not as it should be, is it? Yes, Christ has won the victory. Yes, we have salvation and life both now and forevermore. But then why is this happening? Why is this happening? And why, why do I feel like I'm in this, this long period of silence? Why am I grieving? Why am I experiencing this dark, turbulent time in my life? And we sit right in the middle of this. We sit right in this tension where we say, yes, Christ has won the victory, but here we sit in kind of the not yet fully realized place. It's what Advent is. And so as we come to the table today, I want to invite you to come to the table in that tension. We're going to be singing, one of the songs we're going to be singing is Savior of the Nations Come. Uh, it might be a new one for many of you. Uh, it's one where we, again, we ask for God to come uh, in God's fullness and to bring life to, to us both now and forevermore. Uh, We're also going to be singing Jesus Paid It All, just remembering what Christ has done for us in this supper. And as you come to this table, uh, come bringing your hearts. Receive Christ. uh, Continue to live in that tension and, and ask yourself, what is God doing in me today? What is this bread and what is this cup doing in me as I prepare my heart for Jesus? As I live as a daughter or son of Jesus Christ in the world today, what is God doing? What is God asking me to do in this table?